He's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 25 years of experience. And together, we're the Brief Brothers, having an ongoing conversation about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. We're back, Henry. And we were talking just before we hit the record button about the a previous conversation we had with Lance Saunders, you know, a brilliant uh, planner and uh, now retired uh, chief uh, operating officer at DDB Canada about the lack of training that ad agencies provide for both creatives, account people, as well as planners. And he said, this is a great topic because it's sorely needed and it's absent. And because what I do uh, for a living, which is train for the Association of National Advertisers, kind of puts a bright light on the fact that uh, companies, even agencies, are looking for outside sources of information for training. So let's have this let's let's have this conversation. What's your experience been when you are interviewing young planners or even more experienced planners, and and what has your experience been in terms of training? So let me give you some kind of personal background first. You know, I, I've mentioned before on the on the show that um, I I started out in an agency that had no strategy department or planning department, um, and I realized there was a need we had and set about to teach myself how to do it. Um, obviously made a lot of mistakes, um, didn't know what I was doing. Um, I, you could argue that I still don't, um, but at least I have experience. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until pretty deep into my career that I began working at a DDB agency where there was, I encountered artifacts of a once a pretty vibrant training uh, mechanism or program, um, you know, in the form of CD-ROMs that were lying around that um, talked about the agency philosophy with regard to strategy and to brief writing and had the tools, the, the, the brand briefs, the creative briefs, the project briefs, and those things. And I was fortunate that I had a boss um, at the time who really valued training and was aware of these artifacts and where they were in the office and encouraged me um, to to use them and so I absorbed those things. For me, it was like it was like an archaeologist finding you know these you know very sacred tablets. So I learned a lot from um, those types of things. In fact, I remember a, another. Before that, I worked at a publicist agency, but my boss was uh, the managing director of the office. She was an account person. But she had worked and been kind of inculcated in the YNR way. Mm. And I remember her giving me the YNR formats for the briefs and the tools. Um, so in a way, I had like this amalgam of some of the best thinking that had been passed down, like these, these heirlooms that were passed down from one person to another that I found incredibly useful um, as my and my time as a young planner and even not so um, young planner. But I think now in retrospect, what we see is during the golden age of advertising, probably in the 60s and seven, early 70s, um, the big agencies, you know, before the consolidation of these networks and stuff, really invested in inculcating a way of thinking at their agency of how to think about and to train people. Of course, back then, people spent a lot of time at their ad agencies. There wasn't a revolving door with turnover that we have today. Mm. And then, so I think by the time I entered the agency business in the 90s, that was largely gone. Um, so what the trend that I see, at least on the strategy side, is I think universities do a better job today than they did back then. That doesn't mean they're doing a good job, but they're doing a better job than right. they did back then. Uh, I've taught classes about ad strategy, so they exist, which I think probably 20 years ago did not exist. Um, also, um, a lot of universities have their lab agencies, right? So they have an agency within the communication school that is basically has kids working on ads, doing copywriting, doing writing briefs and stuff. So it gets some kind of some hands-on experience. There's also alternative education, you know, now like the Miami Ad School and, you know, some of the 
art institutes and some of the other kind of institutions of learning that teach advertising and, and communication. So I think on, on the educational, outside of the agency business, I think things are getting better. On the agency side, I think things have deteriorated rapidly. And we are, you know, we have old fogies like me who are basically trying to train a generation without necessarily the materials or the backup or the or the weight of the network um, behind us. So it, it is a, I would say, a, a very challenging time. And I think that you have these young kids, they go straight into a strategy track. They get they have no exposure to other aspects of the agency, which I was very fortunate to get before I got into strategy. And they have just like one narrow what they work, and then they're just kind of making it up as they go along, which you can do. And there's materials out there, your books, um, you know, the, there's books on other books on how to be a strategist. Uh, uh, something I'm seeing is LinkedIn, right? There's a community now of mentors on LinkedIn who are teaching the next, I'm thinking specifically of guys like Julian Cole, um, who are out there um, giving a lot of free stuff away, but also giving paid content, or, you know, selling paid content mm -hmm. to people that want to up their game. How right. do you see it? Well, I'm going to kind of take two approaches here. One, from a creative perspective, because I started my career in the ad agency world as a copywriter. And I, I, I landed my first agency job in the mid 80s I, and I knew nothing. I had a small portfolio. I loved writing long copy, but I had to learn how to be a conceptual thinker and come up with ads. Something I did by, you know, looking over the shoulder of the more senior copywriter who had the office next door. And of course, once I got into the agency, I realized why it had been so difficult to get an agency job in the first place, which was because once you got in, the creative folks basically bounce from one shop to the next. If one agency lost a piece of business, and I and I started in Milwaukee, a relatively small community of advertising, but once a, a, an agency lost a piece of business, the creatives who were working on that would try to migrate to the agency that won the piece of business. I'm not sure the clients understood that they were getting the same the same talent, uh, just with a different you know, agency moniker attached to it. So I learned a lesson there right away. But but by the second or third job I had in Milwaukee, I also encountered something that surprised me and got me really interested in creative briefs. I went to work for a business to business shop in Milwaukee and they didn't have a creative brief. And I kept bugging them. I says, who's going to write the brief? We need to have a brief. And finally, they got tired of me pestering them. They said, fine, we'll write a brief. You do it. I was like, I don't know how to write a brief. Well, I, I, I learned very quickly. And if I, if I could find copies of those briefs that I authored or co-authored, I'd cringe today, I'm sure. But that's really what got me interested in, in writing briefs and how important briefs were as an emerging copywriter. Now, the training that copywriters receive used to be the responsibility of ad agencies, but that went away in the, what, the 80s? We've, we've, you've pointed out that there's been a lot of good training in, from the colleges on, on creative brief writing. Uh, that's where I got my, my interest really peaked, was when I realized I, I was working for agencies that didn't have creative briefs. But from the late 80s until I wrote my first book on creative brief writing in you know, 2009, there was a huge leap because all the agencies that I eventually went to work for did have creative briefs in place. But that's when I got more critical of the quality of those briefs. And finally, it culminated in, in a job I took in Minneapolis when I was the creative director uh, on the British Airways account that I discovered you know, some major holes. And that prompted me to, to come up with my own training. But again, it just pointed out that there was a lack of resources to turn to that, that now are being fulfilled by places like the Association of National Advertisers, which is my employer, where I do a lot of online and, virt and, real, and real training, because there's a demand out there, especially on the brand side. The, yeah, ag the, agencies, the agencies may not realize they need the training, but, but they do. It's, a, it's ironic that the, the, the idea of strategy and, 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 and briefs 
has become widely adopted, but the training has gone away, right? Like before there was training, but it wasn't widely uh, adopted, right? Um, uh, you know, especially planning. Planning came from, you know, the UK, the, the creative shops there utilized it. And then it started to catch like wildfire. It made its way to New York and Chicago and then to, you know, down to little Hispanic creative boutiques in Coral Gables where I was. Um, so it's it, it's definitely interesting. You, you mentioned something, though, that to me I think is interesting, which is having a brief is better than not having a brief, right? Assuming that it's not a horrible, like a brief would really have to be a really bad brief in order for it to be worse than having no brief. Um, but then we get into, okay, but having a good brief is better than having just a mediocre brief, right? right? And that's where we get into like the honing and the polishing of the skills. But I, I think that there's, you know, a case to be made, you know, still particularly, you know, and I think you're doing it on the client side is like, you know, what is a brief for? Wh why is having a brief beneficial? What is you know, what are the downsides of not having a brief? And then you can get into the conversation of, all right, now we've agreed we need a brief. Now let's talk about how to make a brief that's more likely um, than not to spawn some work or some thinking that is likely to be better than what would happen in the alternative of not having the brief. Happily, I'm encountering fewer and fewer people who don't understand or don't believe in the brief. I mean, there are still a few out there who, who you know, who want to play the telephone game, right? Just pass the pass the word amongst everybody and assume that they'll know what they mean and what what it is that we were trying to accomplish. There is a, a much wider embrace embracing of the brief and the briefing process as a valuable commodity, a valuable product to have. So that's a blessing. You know, thankfully we don't have to make the argument. Why do you need this brief? But what I do believe I, I see uh, is still existing in the thinking out there is that the brief is just another form to fill out. It's just one more step, another process, as opposed to this is a critical inspirational tool that can promote the best possible thinking, which can reduce the number of back and forth, repeat rounds back to the well. If you can reduce even by one round, the number of times you send your, your work back to the creative, that has a dollar of value a place to it. That's, and that's something that you and I don't necessarily talk about all the time, but it's there. It's, it's not only it's not only the time and the money, because there's certainly tangibly time and money, but the morale yes. of, the, of the, the wear and tear that it creates on a team, not just the creatives, but the account team and the of going back and getting repeatedly rejected by the client um, is something that we don't spend a lot of time talking about, but that wear and tear is definitely there and it's a destructive force in a, in a creative environment. And, um, and you, you might be surprised, maybe you're not surprised, but I have heard a number of times when I ask, you know, marketers, you know, how many times does it take before they get the work they want? They'll stop me and say, we build in five rounds of creative. And I say, why? That's you're, demoralizing. You're, exactly. It's it's your you're planning for failure and it makes no sense. And that's one of the things that I try to change minds about. Yeah. Getting back to you know what I'm looking for when I'm hiring a strategist and, and what advice I might give to a young strategists. Listen, given the dearth of of training that exists and uh, that even I'll be able to give you, right? If you, I hire you, I mean, I'll definitely mentor you and point you in the right directions. I'm looking for people that are open, right? That are looking to improve themselves. You know, if they come into the interview and they mention some of the books that I like to mention, like how brands grow, um, you know, those types of things tell me these people are interested in understanding what came before. Um, because there's a lot that we can learn from what came before. And so I think you need to be a self learner, a self teacher, um, and really go out there and, and the resources are out there where the fortunate thing is that we live in the internet age. And so the right. collective wisdom of millennia is all available. And, you know, the hundred years of advertising wisdom is available. And we're, 
we're very lucky that we have you know people that are cataloging that history and and um, and you know putting it into print for us to read it today. So um, you know Martin Mayer's uh, Madison Avenue USA is a is a great you know book from the 1950s about advertising. And it tells you, oh, that's why that is that way. And right. I think you can't teach somebody to be curious about the history. No, of the you, you have that. That's a built-in requirement. If you don't have that curiosity, you probably should find another line of work. I remember interviewing a young copywriter who wanted to come to work at the agency. I was at DDB here in LA. This was a long time ago. And I asked him, like, what, what kind of things does he like to read? And he says, I'm not much of a reader. I said, well, you know, I didn't say this, but it's like, if you're not a reader, you're never going to be a writer. Yeah. You, can't, you can't learn how to write. You can't polish your writing skills. You can't improve your writing skills if you don't read. Absolutely. The two, the two are ahead. I, I, absolutely. I've always been an advocate. You know, I, I've said you can't expect to write well if you don't read a lot. If you don't read voraciously, right. um, you're not going to, you know, um, be exposed to different styles, to different ways of writing to different ways of telling stories to you know and then find your own voice within that and this was a candidate for a copywriting position but that's equally true probably more so for a creative brief writer you yeah. have to be able to articulate well that's you one of my that's one of my you know commandments when i teach brief writing is brief writing is writing mm -hmm. so anything that applies to being a writer applies to being a brief writer you were you were sharing, I think, in a recent episode that you had looked at a creative brief by a colleague that really impressed you, and what one of the one of the answers to the questions that he that he provided was something like three or four words, and it astounded you because they were the perfect three or four words. Absolutely, I mean, it is a skill um, that you need to develop, and it doesn't happen overnight. And you know, you you mentioned look back at the briefs that you wrote early on and you cringe. I think most <laughs> writers about, yeah. will say that about any of their writing. Um, I think we all have this feeling that we get better and wiser, the more experience. And I think that's, that's legitimate. I think you can't compare an early Beatles tune to the stuff that they did later on down the road as they matured as musicians and songwriters. Right. Um, so I think we have to be, generous with ourselves and forgiving of ourselves. Um, yes, absolutely. All, all right. right, Howard. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. Okay, Henry, we're back for our creative review. And today we're going to look at a spot. A fair, it's a fairly new spot, part of a, a long running campaign for Postmates. Let's take a look. Hey, 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 someone getting rid of this? Looks like it. It's so crispy. Uh, you don't want it? No. <laughs> when all you can pizza is think about, Postmates. Okay, Henry, what'd you think? You know, uh, I liked it. Um, you know, at first I was a little bit, what am I watching? Like, what's this big pizza on the ground? Um, and then when the reveal happened, and uh, I think the end line is is great. Um, when all you can pizza is think about, or all you can, yeah, pizza is think about. <laughs> I know, um, it makes you, it kind of makes you double think. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I think it's, grabs attention, right? So we're, we're we're breaking through. Um, there's a little smile there. It entertains. Um, and there's an insight there uh, that as a consumer, you can nod your head and kind of, oh, I, they're talking about when you're hungry and all you can think about is food, which is something that everybody has had at one point or another. Um, so I, I think it meets a lot of uh, the tests, right, for creative in terms of it breaks through. Um, it's entertaining uh, to a degree. I mean, it's not, you know, uh, a Francis Ford Coppola movie, but right. it's a, it's a, it's a laugh. It's a 30 second laugh. It's worth a laugh. 
Right. And then it's rooted in something that people acknowledge is, is part of their lives, which is dealing with um, urges um, or, uh, for different types of, of food, right? When you get an urge for something specific, and it, the last, I think, filter is goes well with the brand, right? Like the Postmates is a food delivery brand, right? So what they do is is they answer those urges, those um, desires um, for consumers. So kind of making that come to life in a absurd way, I think, is is a, a clever thing. I, overall, I think you know, I'll give it a thumbs up. I also can see, you know, we had a conversation about idea versus execution. And I think there's an idea here, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, but there's also a very strong executional element that we see. They have a couple other spots in this campaign. We might put the link there for, I think, some French fries. Uh, the other one is like a sushi roll. Um, they do tacos and they do burgers. I think the original campaign started off with tacos. Yeah. Um, so um, it is campaignable in that sense, but you could also see where they could take it into other, maybe it could be into words, like where you're hearing words um, of pizza, 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 but you're not necessarily seeing the item, right? right. Um, so there's different ways to execute this idea, but it it has does have strong execution. Yeah, I agree. The one thing that, that came to mind as I was watching this, because I have to admit when I first saw the campaign and I think it broke during the pandemic, uh, it was the taco spot. And I wasn't, you know, like most people, you're watching TV, you're, the commercial comes on, you, you turn your attention to something else. And I heard, I saw this, and they said, when when all you can tacos is think about it, I said, what? Hey, huh? What? It threw me. And that's what draws you in, right? So I started to think about this, and I realized this is similar to the Snickers campaign, because their insight was, you know, when you're hungry, you're not yourself. Now, I don't bring this up as a critique. I think it, it fits into this insight that you talked about at the beginning of our of our review. It's a universal thing that all humans recognize. When you're hungry, all of a sudden, other things get in the way, which is why most people say don't go shopping on an empty stomach because you come home with stuff that you don't you wouldn't otherwise buy because you're not thinking the same way when you're hungry. So that's that's a great insight. But it's still the question I asked is, is this as good as? Well, I don't think it matters. I think it's an entirely different approach from the Snickers campaign, and it works because it leaves you hanging. It's like, okay, what is this thing? What food item is this thing that this guy is is craving that he sees as sushi or French fries or pizza? And you want to know, okay, what what is it going to be? And you're waiting. And that's yeah. what holds your attention, and that's what makes it entertaining. So that's another thing that I like about it. It worked really well. You brought up an interesting point, which is two points you brought up, which are super interesting. One is, you know, is this the same insight as Snickers? And I think it's very close, right? Um, but I think they're both related to food. And uh, building off of an insight that's true and correct, I don't see that as a sin. They didn't. They didn't plagiarize the execution. No, um, no, not at, at all. all. Um, I, I don't see that as a sin. But then the second thing that you brought up was, is it better? And the answer is, just like you said, it doesn't matter because this isn't an, for an award jury, right? Like they're they're fulfilling two different needs for the brand that they're advertising, right? Snickers is a candy bar. Let's face it, it a candy bar has a certain role, right? But Postmates has a potentially much bigger role in consumers' lives, right? There are people that don't eat candy, trying to watch their weight, whatever, but we all eat and we all tend to eat a lot of takeout food, right? So the delivery of accessible takeout food is something that I think is a lot closer to people. And this campaign also delivers on variety, right? right. It's the variety of things that you can get from, from Postmates. So you could see how even, you know, I'm a big, my weakness is pizza. So seeing that that ad like makes you think, oh yeah, that's the way I'm about pizza. Like that's the, I actually did, I had to do once, I was working uh, on a fast food client at the time and I did a one question survey monkey survey to prove a point. And the, and the, the question was an open-ended question says, imagine that you were on a deserted island um, and, and all, there was plenty of food for you 
to eat there between the coconuts and the fish and everything. What's the one food that you would crave that you couldn't get <laughs> from? And, you know, the, the biggest answers that we got was pizza. And our client at the time was a sandwich shop. And I said, you see, guys, people don't crave sandwiches. Like a sandwich is like today I want a sandwich. Like a sandwich is a good, it's utilitarian. It's not something that people necessarily crave as their as their top. So let's let's bring this back to the creative brief. And we don't know what the creative brief was, but we both have commented on, in fact, you sent me the link to uh the founder of an agency called gut his name is um, what's his name again and ansel anselmo yes and he had a he had a question or he had a he had a point he wanted to make about what every creative brief should include in terms of a question what is it that i'm supposed to feel about this product or service so my question is and i think i, I have an answer but i want to know what your answer is what i um, loved about what i loved about this campaign is that it is about variety, but the challenges of the, for a creative is I'm supposed to sell a service that provides pizza and burgers and, and cheese. And blah, 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 I mean, a thousand different kinds of meals. How do I sell that? And they did a really great job because they landed on an, a believable universal emotion. I, th I have an idea what that emotion is. What do you think the emotion was that this that made this work so well? Oh, wow. You're putting me on the spot. I know and, I am. I know I am. <laughs> you know, the emotion in my mind is desire. Um, you know, these people, they're, they're treating these objects. They see it, they're encountering that they be in their hunger yeah. fever. Their fevered logic is the, is the food. And, and as, as I said, as a pizza lover, I can relate to that whole oh, pizza, that, that uh, scratch that you need to itch that desire. Yeah. Yeah, you, and you said craving before too. So I was going to say, this is an easy to empathize with campaign. I empathize with that person who is craving the sushi, the tacos, the French fries. I get that. Yeah. So whether we agree on the emotion or not, you know, we could, if we were working on the brief, we'd be debating what that emotion needs to be because that's the emotion we'd want to communicate to the creative department. But the fact is, we need to identify that emotion because when you capture, a when a communication captures that emotion, all of a sudden you've got the hook. And that's what I think makes this spot powerful or this campaign powerful. Excellent. Good stuff, Howard. Good stuff, Henry. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Eibach. And together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye.